Let us begin with a prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the eternal High Priest, who offers himself to you and is the sacrifice acceptable. We are thankful that you have received that sacrifice, have accepted it in love for our salvation. Help us to understand the sacrament of holy orders and how through it the church continues to minister in the person of Jesus Christ who continues to remain with us in the Holy Spirit for he lives and reigns forever and ever Amen, amen. and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Amen today we are going to be reviewing or going over um, the chapter on holy orders which in the catechism I can find it is um, chap chapter 20. Um, I'm not going to follow it specifically, but it is chapter 20 for your own uh, review afterwards or, or reading as, as we go on. The most important day in my religious life, can anybody describe what that day would be or name what that day would be? My ordination. Wrong. <laughs> my baptism, right. The baptism. My baptism was the most important day in my religious life. But right up there next to it is ordination. Okay. Um, but let me describe a baptism. Because when I was baptized, I believe as a Catholic, that it was God who chose me and everyone who's baptized, who loved me and everyone in the world. And through that, Jesus Christ made me a part of God's priestly people, called to worship the Father in, with, and through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this way, we share in the church's highest form of worship. And we are made part of a community where God gives us everything that we need in terms of grace to uh, make possible our eternal salvation. But among the priestly people of God, and God chooses men to share in the ministerial priesthood, or that what we would call the ordained priesthood. So the sacrament of holy orders that we're going to be studying tonight has three groupings. The order of bishops, which is the fullness of holy orders uh, that a human being can receive. Uh, that of priesthood, also called presbyters in the church. And then finally that of deacons. Now let me describe a little bit about what the priesthood is in general. And for us to understand that, we have to really go back to the Old Testament priesthood. Going back to the early history of Israel, we see that priests were an essential part of God's chosen people. And their function was to act as mediators between God and people, or God and man. A priest was first of all a mediator. He stood between the people whom he represented and the God whom he addressed. So that would be kind of a description of the Old Testament priest. There are two kinds of these mediators uh, in the Old Testament. There were mediators from God to communicate his mind and his will to the people. And these mediators are called prophets. They were from God to the people. Then there were mediators from the people to God to offer him the people's adoration, invoke his aid, and beg his mercy for the people's sins. These were called priests. They were to offer sacrifices of goats 
and sheep, of oxen and cattle, of bread and wine. Melchizedek does that. That's why he is named in the first uh, Eucharistic prayer of the Catholic Church, also known as the Roman Canon. They were to offer gifts of wheat, barley, oats, and fruits of trees. The Old Testament priest offered sacrifice. Only those specifically chosen by God were permitted to offer sacrifice, and you usually had to, to come from a priestly clan or family. But a priest had to be divinely chosen in the Old Testament. So we have to keep that in mind because the priesthood of the New Testament is not a rupture with the Old Testament understanding of priesthood, but is in continuity with it, but there is a change as well. There's change within continuity, if you will. <clears throat> the priesthood in Christianity, there are three types, as we understand it as Catholics. First of all, there is the exclusive priesthood of Jesus Christ. He is the high priest of the church, and, and um, uh, it is exclusive to him. By his incarnation, Jesus... Um, offered to his heavenly father all the acts of his human will. Christ's priesthood began in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary when he was conceived. He lived his priesthood throughout his life, but especially on the cross, where he united all the acts of a mortal human being capable of suffering and of death into one supreme sacrifice by which he became the mediator par excellence between the human race and God. Jesus continues his exclusive high priesthood even now through the sacrifice of the Mass. As our eternal high priest, Jesus worships, praises, and thanks the divine majesty in his own name and in the name of his people. He intercedes before the throne of the Father for us. Being heard by the Father, he keeps sending down blessings on us from his heavenly home. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is the only one fundamental priesthood in the church today. All other priesthoods are participations in this one priesthood. Okay? So Jesus replaces the priesthood of the Old Testament and becomes not only the mediator between God and man, but also between man and God. Uh, and he also satisfies... Uh, uh, the sacrifice that God demands. He is the sacrificial offering and that is made explicit on the cross. Now the second uh, type of priesthood in Christianity, which is configured obviously to, to the main one, who is Jesus Christ, those ordained to the ministerial priesthood, identified as the sacrament of holy orders, is the next type. The ordained priesthood of bishops and priests, as well as deacons, began at the Last Supper when the Savior did two things. First of all, he changed bread and wine into himself and already offered the night before he died the death that he would endure the next day on Good Friday. So obviously the Last Supper was on Holy Thursday evening and he uh, presented that sacrifice to the apostles in the form of bread and wine uh, in anticipation of what would occur on Good Friday. Then he told the apostles to do what he did in commemoration of me. It is a defined article of Catholic faith, a dogma, that the ordained priesthood, ministerial priesthood, the sacrament of holy orders, was instituted personally by Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. Okay. Thirdly, beyond the ordained ministerial priesthood, which is unique and possessed only by those who receive the sacrament of holy orders, there is a true, although subordinate, sense in which all the baptized faithful belong to the priesthood of Christ. We begin to share in the priesthood of Jesus when we are baptized uh, into the church, and this sacramental character which we receive at holy baptism is deepened in the sacrament of confirmation and continually strengthened when we uh, participate in the sacrifice of the Mass and receive Holy Communion worthily. It is because of this share in Christ's priesthood that the people of God, clergy and laity, are enabled to offer with the ordained priest at the altar the body and blood of 
the Son of God to his heavenly Father. So that in a nutshell is the, the, the basis or the premise of, of, of the priesthood in the Catholic Church. It comes from the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, the high priest, is the fulfillment of not only all of the Old Testament priesthood, but also that of the sacrifice that is offered to God. No other sacrifices are necessary, just that one sacrifice. And the Catholic priesthood, or the sacrament of holy orders, I should say, uh, as Catholics understand it, uh, is a share in that high priesthood to continue the ministry of Christ and to continue the perpetuation of that one sacrifice. Now, it is a misnomer to believe that every time you come to Mass on Sunday, or any day of the week, that the Catholic priest is re-sacrificing Christ. There is no second or third sacrifice. It is the one sacrifice that is offered each time at every Mass because the one sacrifice of Christ is now part of eternity. So we step out of time where there's no longer time, the constraints of time, there's no longer the constraints of a physical place, um, and it is now available to everyone at all times and all places, but it is the one sacrifice. Now there would be some in uh, uh, of the Reformed Church and in, in Protestantism who would accuse the church, Catholic Church of, of re-sacrificing Christ as though his one sacrifice isn't enough, and that's what the Mass is, a re-sacrifice to make better uh, the one that wasn't sufficient. That's not what we're doing. It is the one sacrifice uh, represented in an unbloody way through the uh, ministry of the priest uh, that we celebrate at every Mass. Is there any question on that before I continue on? Okay. So the ordained ministry is a special call from God, the ordained priesthood, or that of holy orders. Now, in terms of, you know, how does somebody become a priest in the Catholic Church? Well, first of all, you have to have a calling. And that calling has to have two aspects to it. Now, I keep moving and that's messing up the cameraman over there. Uh, he keeps jumping up every time I go over here. What am I doing? Why is he jumping up? Uh, but anyway, uh, that calling has two aspects. So I, I, let me just reflect on my own experience. I never thought that I would become a priest. Uh, in fact, um, when I made my first Holy Communion um, in Augusta back in 1960, I think it was, or somewhere around that time, um, right afterwards, the pastor of our parish sent a letter to my parents inviting young boys who had just made their first Holy Communion to become altar boys, and that there would be a class starting up. And my father came to me and said, well, Father Quinlan would like for you to become an altar board. Do you want to become one? And I said, no. <laughs> and then I said this, and I remember it clearly to this day. They will try to make me into a priest. <laughs> and my father respected my, my decision. He did not force it on me. He invited me, but said, fine, if you don't want to, you don't have to. And I didn't. So, you know, I got into high school and... As a junior and senior, I dated like every other uh, kid in my uh, class and, you know, had a job, went to college, had a steady girlfriend, thought I would get married. But then towards the end of my junior year of college, or maybe it was even in my senior year, I can't recall now, um, I decided that I wanted to get more involved in the church and uh, became a lector and... And through that, uh, I was elected to the parish council, and uh, then uh, I started to get to know the priest in the parish on a different level than I had known before. You know, prior to that, it was just seeing them at Mass, and, you know, it just seemed so different than what I was all about. And I thought, well, that's all they do is say Mass every day and then go home and go to bed. Uh, and then when I... <laughs> Then when I realized well, they do a lot more and they're human beings and, and they're just like me, it started the, the wheels turning and, and I began to kind of think, well, this might be something that I could do. So one thing led to another and I applied to the diocese and I was interviewed by our vocation director and then by the bishop and he finally accepted me. And that's the second aspect of that call. There has to be not only the desire to want to become a priest, but then the church through the bishop has to call you, okay? Uh, so I could want to become a priest until I'm blue in the face, but if the bishop doesn't think I have the calling, I'm not going to get ordained. 
Or let's say the bishop thinks that I do have a calling and he's trying to convince me, but if I don't have the desire, I'm not going to get ordained. Uh, so the calling has two aspects, but it is a, a divine calling and somehow in all of that uh, the Holy Spirit is at work. So the ordained priesthood is a special call to the service of the Word of God through writing, preaching, teaching, and living the faith. Priests, meaning bishops, priests, and deacons, those in holy orders, are called to reflect on the Word of God and to share it with others. My own reluctance to enter the priesthood was based upon uh, a fear of getting up in public, believe it or not, and, and speaking uh, publicly. In fact, when I went in the seminary, I said, if I can't get over this phobia of getting up in public, then I'll just leave the seminary. And then, I think it was the second year in seminary when we had our first course on homiletics or preaching, uh, the professor for homiletics would not let us use notes when we got up to give a, a, a practice homily. And I thought, well, this is it, I'm gone. Uh, this just isn't going to happen. But, um, but he taught us a way of, of preaching and memorizing an outline uh, that has served me very well over the years and has actually uh, helped to lessen some of the anxieties I have about uh, getting up um, in, in person. Um, the other thing was my own personal sinfulness. I thought, well, how in the world is God calling me to be a, a priest? Because in my own mind, I thought, well, priests have to be perfect. And, uh, and I knew that I wasn't. So I had to kind of grow in that uh, awareness and rely upon God's mercy to make up what was lacking in my own life. So the ordained ministry is a special call to the, the service of worship uh, and the celebration of the church's sacraments within the context of the church's liturgy and sacraments. We worship God and um, the priest encourages or brings the, together the community to worship God as well, as well. The ordained ministry is a special call to, of service of leadership. Um, now, this is another aspect that is different from the Old Testament priesthood. And Jesus makes it quite clear in his public ministry. If, you know, in the Old Testament, um, Jews were very concerned about being kept pure and, and not becoming unclean by touching anything that was nasty or whatever. Uh, and um, Jesus Christ, on the other hand, in his public ministry, touched the lepers and healed the sick and ate with the sinners and seemed to uh, make himself unclean through his service of those he came to redeem, correct? <clears throat> Whereas the Old Testament priest kind of just stayed in the temple and offered his sacrifice and kind of was aloof and separate from the world, Jesus Christ was fully integrated into the world and got his hands dirty ministering to the needy. Now, we say the church teaches that the, holy, the sacrament of holy orders was um, established on Holy Thursday, uh, especially when Jesus uh, consecrated the bread and wine and told the apostles to do this in memory of me. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those Gospels, have a very clear narrative on what Jesus did at the Last Supper, correct, in terms of taking the bread, breaking it, giving it to them, and they eat it. John's Gospel, on the other hand, does not include that, okay? Uh, but it presumes it, obviously, but it does not include it explicitly. But he includes something that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not include as a part of the Last Supper scenario. Does anybody know what it is that he does? Say that again louder. The washing of the, the, washing of the feet, which was meant to convey to these new bishops or these new priests that their ministry was not going to be exactly like the Old Testament uh, priests who offered sacrifices where they were aloof and separate from the people. But they were to be a part of people's lives and offer worship, not worship, but offer service to them. And Jesus gives them the example of washing their feet. And if Jesus the high priest is doing that, how much more should those who are configured to the high priest in the sacrament of holy orders do the same thing? So the, the, the Catholic understanding of holy orders, and specifically of bishops, priests, and deacons, is not only a worship cult, if you will, in the positive sense of that word cult, but it is also one of service, of being amongst the people, of ministering to the sick, feeding the poor, 
uh, and taking care of the needs of those who come to us. So it is a special call of service. The ordained ministry is also a special call uh, to service through consecration to God. The lives of, of those in holy orders are to be totally dedicated to the work of God. We are called to witness to the things of heaven. We are public churchmen. In the Western Rite or the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church, which is what we are members of, uh, and, and it's important for you to understand that in the Roman Catholic Church there are two major rites. The Western Rite, which would be um, everything in Western Europe and mostly here in the United States and, and in the uh, Southern Hemisphere, is called the Roman Rite or the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church. The Eastern Rite would be everything kind of in Eastern Europe, going into Turkey, Asia Minor, and, and uh, the Middle East. And their location of leadership uh, historically was in Constantinople, which was taken over by the Muslims and renamed uh, Istanbul. Um, and their form of worship, the manner in which the priesthood is exercised, uh, took on different cultural aspects that uh, the European, the Western European did not uh, embrace. But they were just as valid as, as uh, the Western Church. Okay? So there's, there are different aspects to the priesthood in the Western Rite of the Church and in the, and in the Eastern Rite. In the Western Rite or the Latin Rite, Catholic priests are called to celibacy. Whereas in the Eastern Rite, only bishops are called to celibacy, but priests may be married. Okay? And deacons, obviously, uh, can be married. Um, but they must be married before they are ordained priests. Okay? So in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, there is a married priesthood, but they must be married before they are ordained priests. But only monastics are selected to become bishops, meaning uh, somebody that lives in a monastery who has made a promise of celibacy. Only those priests who are celibate become bishops in uh, the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church. And the same thing is true with the Orthodox Church. Uh, even in the Orthodox Church, the bishops are, come from the, uh, the monasteries, not from the married clergy. They have to be celibate as well. So for me, in the Latin Rite, all, all priests basically in the Latin Rite are called to celibacy. And for us, we understand that to be a call, but also a gift, and not something that everyone is called to. So in discerning the call to priesthood, one has to also discern whether or not they are called to uh, celibacy, which is the sacrifice of giving up marriage and a lifetime intimate partner uh, in marriage, a wife, and and family. Uh, it, is, it is a call to chastity. It is a special witness and gift as such um, and, and is a part of our Latin Rite tradition, although there are exceptions. And one of the biggest exceptions that's being made right now is for Episcopalian priests who have become dissatisfied with the Episcopal Church and their congregations. Pope Benedict the uh, 16th is allowing those who have a strong desire to become Catholic, their married priests and even their married bishops can be ordained Catholic priests. And they're forming a, a, an association for these former Episcopalians, Anglicans, where they can uh, maintain some of their customs as Episcopalians, uh, but be fully Roman Catholic at the same time. And their priests are being who are married uh, are being reordained as Catholic priests. Yes? Now, their bishops, though, can only be priests. Is that not correct? Correct. Their bishops cannot be ordained bishops because they're married, unless they're not married, which is, not, is, is a little bit rare uh, in the Episcopal Church. Yes? What if uh, can they uh, say you were married and your wife died? Can you be called after them to be yep. a priest? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, uh, there are many Catholic priests who have been married and have become widowed and then are, are become priests. That's, that's quite possible, yeah. Also, uh, <clears throat> if a married priest's wife dies, he cannot remarry. Okay, yes? Yeah, I knew a priest in Savannah did that exact thing. 
exact same thing. He was a Navy sub commander back in the day. Then he converted, his wife died, he became a priest. He was here in Macon for a while. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But I was curious, I forget his name. I think it was, uh, I don't know, this was 10, 15, 18 years ago when I was getting into union down there and he let me stay in the cottage. But I was curious, do you think there'll ever be a day when that will, uh, when they'll go ahead and say, well, you can go ahead and get married like everybody else? I mean, what's the no. Why it be no. Like, no. Well, kind of the, let me tell you what could happen. We could borrow the way the Eastern Rite does it, meaning married men may become priests down the line. And we're already seeing that with the Anglican uh, priests coming over. But you will never see a day where the church will allow priests who are already priests to get married and still function as priests. Okay? That won't happen because there's not a tradition of that either in the West or in the East. Uh, even in the Orthodox Church, uh, once you're ordained a priest, you have to be married before you ordain, and if your wife dies, you are not allowed to get remarried and still function as a priest. Okay. Did you know William Collins? I did. Did you? Mm -hmm. so, you, I do. <laughs> he's like a Right, but he has been suspended. Now, that's the other thing. If a Catholic priest does get married, he can't get married and still function as a priest, okay? And there is a way for a priest to be released from the promises that he made in order to be married. But once he's married, he can no longer function as a priest, okay? Except in an emergency. Because once you're ordained a priest, you are always a priest, no matter what, okay? what you've done or what you've said or what crimes you've committed, once you are ordained validly a priest, you are a priest forever, even if the church defrocks you, okay? Now when we say defrock, that's not really, defrocking is kind of a, a, a Protestant term for Protestant clergy that are, are you know, suspended from ministry. In the Catholic Church we call it laicization. You are returned to the lay state. That's okay. a little bit less invasive. Yes. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. But theologically, you are still a priest. So, let's say the most notorious pedophile priest in prison uh, is released, and of course he's defrocked or laicized, and, and I drop on the sidewalk with a major heart attack and I'm dying and this uh, defrocked priest comes by walking and I recognize, oh I know you, and he says, yeah but I'm defrocked uh, and I said, I'm dying, I am said I'm defrocked, I said, but you can still hear my confession uh, and he could in that circumstance offer me absolution, okay, because once a priest, uh, always a priest, uh, so, so, so that's an important thing, but the church can legislate whether or not you can function. For example, if the bishop took, let's say that I got the bishop angry and I was preaching heresy, he could remove from me the, the permission to preach. Okay, I'd still be a priest, I might be able to hear confessions and celebrate mass, but I couldn't preach. Or he might remove from me the permission to hear confessions, but I could do other things. Or if it's a very serious crime that I've committed or sinned, uh, he could uh, petition the Pope to remove me from the, or from the clerical state and return me to being canonically or church law wise a lay person. But I'm like still a priest. Line item veto of your, of your, of your right. Priest, kind of. Correct, correct. That is possible. That could be possibly done. Sometimes priests do stupid things and the bishop might symbolically punish him by suspending him for maybe a month. Uh, to let the, the, the congregation know that this behavior isn't going to be put up. Let's say that he got a drunk driving ticket or something. Um, he could do things, uh, he can take disciplinary action against a priest and remove his ability temporarily to celebrate the sacraments. Okay. The worst of those being uh, excommunication? Well, excommunication would be different. Uh, it would, that would be even a more serious step. Um, and that's a good question I, I, that I don't think I can answer. If a priest is excommunicated, he's still a, a priest um, and could be brought back, uh, could be reinstituted in the church easily through repentance and all the rest of that. Yeah, but he has to publicly repent. No, excommunication is never permanent. If there can always be a repentance and a public yeah. reconciliation. Yes. No, the bishop has to, uh, there has to be a canonical or church law, church court procedure that goes all the way to Rome 
but the bishop has to uh, apply for it and send it to Rome. Okay. Does everybody understand the reason for celibacy in, in the, the church, whether it's in the East or the West, is to be a, a, a sign of Jesus Christ who himself was celibate, right? He never married. And his spouse is the church. Uh, uh, so that's important. Yes? Uh, was his uh, disciples also that way? Because it never... No, they were, they were married when, okay. when they were called. What we do not know, of course, uh, what we do not know is what their status was after um, they were ordained at the Last Supper. Do they continue to have marital relations or do they, uh, we don't know. We presume that they, they were. So, but celibacy began to develop very early in the church and has a very, very long tradition. Um, <clears throat> What are the different orders of ordained ministry? Well, we've already said it's bishop, priest, and, and deacon. The bishop shares in the fullness of holy orders. Through ordination, uh, the bishop becomes a member of the College of Bishops, all the bishops of the world in union with the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope. And every bishop of the world can trace their ancestry, if you will, in an unbro unbroken line back to one of the Twelve Apostles. So keep in mind that after the resurrection, the apostles were to go to the whole world with the good news. And they established the church in different locales and eventually ended up in, in northern Europe or in, or in Europe itself and in, in Rome and established churches there. And they would ordain men to be priests or bishops of that locality and then they would go on. And then these bishops would ordain other bishops as, as uh, time went on. So every bishop of the Catholic Church, there is what we call apostolic succession. Now it's very clear with the Pope, right? He is the successor of St. Peter. It's very easy to go back uh, and name every Pope from Benedict all the way back to St. Peter, and we have a list of them. Uh, it's more difficult with local bishops because they come to us through a lot of other means, okay? Bishops, ordaining new bishops in new places, but all of those bishops can trace themselves back to one of the twelve, at least to one of the eleven, if not um, um, to St. Peter. The bishop shares in the mission of the total church under the authority of the Pope. Only a bishop can ordain a deacon or a priest, and he is the normal minister for confirmation. He is the only one that has uh, the right to govern a diocese. Uh, and his promise of obedience is directly to the Pope. So there's a, a, a link between the Bishop of Rome and every bishop. And there's a, an obedience to the Pope in the areas of faith, morals, and church law. Not, you know, in terms of opinions about politics or anything like that. It has to be um, defined church teaching. Um, bishops share in the office of teaching, ruling, and sanctifying the church. That is their role, to teach, rule, and sanctify. Uh, and, and they can do it autocratically if they wish, or they can consult with the laity if they wish. In fact, church law today says that they should consult, meaning uh, test the waters, listen to what the people are saying and then, uh, but they have to hand on the faith, morals, and church law of the church. Uh, they can't do their own thing. They can't become a congregation in and of themselves independent of the Church of Rome. Just as this parish cannot become an independent congregation of the other parishes in this city or in this diocese, nor can I do anything that uh, Bishop um, Hartmeyer would not want me to do. He is technically the pastor of this parish. I'm his assistant. So that brings us to the order of priests. <clears throat> a priest does not share in the fullness of holy orders, as the bishop does, <clears throat> but he is ordained by the bishop to assist the bishop in his ministry of proclaiming the gospel, shepherding the faithful, celebrating the Eucharist, and the other sacraments. Priests are co-workers with the bishop and are called to make a promise, or in some cases a vow of obedience to their bishop. In other words, as a Catholic priest and pastor here at St. Joseph's, I am not in private practice, okay? I can't just do whatever I want to do. Now, there's some leeway, and I have a certain amount of authority, 
but I'm acting in the name of the bishop who is the pastor of this parish because he can't be everywhere. So in a sense we can say that the Catholic Church is a mega church, okay? Uh, the Diocese of Savannah is one church with a bunch of satellites uh, for small groups. Our small group happens to be uh, 1,400 families, uh, but other parishes might be smaller, might be larger, okay? But we're all under the pastorate of Bishop Gregory Hartmeyer, okay? And I'm simply um, one of his small group leaders, if you will. Uh, yes? Correct. Now, by that, one main bishop. Now, a larger diocese may have helper bishops, uh, but they would be um, um, under the, 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 the bishop. So, for example, the Archdiocese of Atlanta has an auxiliary bishop. So there's Archbishop uh, Gregory. Wilton Gregory, and, I, and there's a Hispanic uh, auxiliary bishop, which I can't think of his name. He's, 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 Samara, uh, uh, Bishop Samara. Okay. In fact, we thought we would get him as our bishop, uh, but then we got um, Bishop Hartmeyer. So these other bishops, they'd be like the, you say, if he's a correlation, they'd be like the offensive three defense coordinators to the bishop as head coach. Kind of, I guess. <laughs> I never thought of it like that, but yeah. <laughs> That's kind of a good analogy, I guess. Yes. But, but it's a, a bishop, right? He's been ordained. Yeah, he's ordained a bishop, right. right. And an auxiliary bishop is a bishop too, but he doesn't have the same authority as the, the, right. the main bishop. Yes. Do you know how um, you're called to be a priest? Are you also, not you, but as one, also called to be a bishop? Yes. Or is that something that other people decide or... Both. Um, most people who are wise, most priests who are wise in the Catholic Church do not um, tell anybody that they want to be a bishop, and, and if they do tell them, then they're sent off for uh, psychiatric care. Uh, so <laughs> in, in the Catholic Church, you know, the Episcopal Church has a, a way of nominating someone to become a bishop uh, and then it's approved by their house of laity or whatever. I'm not sure how it works but it's a more open democratic process. It's not so in the Catholic Church. Now that's not divi divinely revealed the way we do it. It could become more democratic and it has been in other times and in other places. But currently the way a bishop is called to be a bishop is and the Pope has to name a bishop a bishop. It comes directly from the Pope. But the Pope needs obviously helpers to identify who would be bishop material. So every country has what's called a papal nuncio or uh, an, um, a papal, an apostolic, I can't remember, if you're not a nuncio there's another name for it. Legate. Apostolic legate or something of like that, I think I remember. What was it before we had, a, sta a nuncio is an ambassador, okay, but before we had ambassador relationship with the Vatican, the apostolic nuncio, the apostolic nuncio. Um, I guess that's what it was. But anyway, yeah, right. So he travels the country, he polls all the bishops of this country as to who they would recommend to be bishops. Occasionally we'll, priests will get letters asking us to suggest someone who might be a bishop and there would be a whole host of questions that we'd have to answer. All that's sent to Washington, this is where the priest is, uh, the bishop is that does this. Then when there is a vacancy, uh, he will look at you know, the pool that he has and um, after he's done appropriate investigations and all of that, he might then suggest to the Pope that this person should become the bishop of the Diocese of Savannah. So let's pretend that it's our diocese. And he suggests to the Pope that it should be Father Gregory Hartmeyer, who is in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. If the Pope says yes, then the Papal Nuncio calls Bishop uh, Father Hartmeyer and asks him if he would become the bishop of Savannah. The priest does not have very long to respond and it's almost uh, on the spot. You have to kind of say yes or no. There's not a lot of, of, of wiggle room here. It's kind of like Jesus going up to any of the uh, apostles and calling them and said, come follow me and they drop everything and they follow him. So uh, it's kind of based on that. Now, it, but the priest does have the right to say no. Okay. 
But once you say no, you will not be asked again. Okay? Uh, so, so many priests do say no who have, who have been called. So, so the same uh, principle is at work, uh, although the, the call comes first from the church, and then you have to decide whether or not this is a calling that you have or can accomplish. And then you could, based on that, you could say no. Okay? Yes. You, you might have a desire internally. You might have could, or you might have or gifts, or you know. I don't. I would hope nobody would say yes that didn't think that they could do it. Uh, occasionally, it does happen, and then you know there's administrative problems, all the rest of that, because they're not able to carry out what they need to do. So it's not an infallible decision in terms of getting everybody who's perfect, but there is a calling there. Yes. It's cardinals. Cardinals. Yeah. yeah I, I'm going to get into that in a second. So, 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 uh, just let me complete the first part here. Um, so, so the next uh, level of of ordination or holy orders is that of a deacon who assists the bishops and the priests. Uh, and their ministry is more of service, of feeding the poor and the hungry, visiting the sick. Uh, but they can also baptize, they can also preach a homily, they can witness a marriage outside of a, a, a mass. They can teach, so they have other things that they can do. Uh, now, in the Catholic Church there are two types of deacons. The first type is called a transitional deacon. So when I was called to the priesthood, or join the seminary. I went through seminary, major seminary. So you have, you know, your high school graduation. You have four years of college normally, and then you have four years of theology. At the end of your third year of theology, if you are to become a priest, you are ordained a transitional deacon, which is like an internship, so, and that usually lasts uh, anywhere from six months to a year, and then you're ordained a priest. But then we have another group of deacons that are called permanent or vocational deacons. And we have two in this parish, Deacon Don Coates and Deacon Tom Eden. And their ministry is to be a deacon, period. And not necessarily in full-time church work. They could have a secular job and, and do uh, the role of the deacon in their part-time as kind of a, a volunteer ministry. But they are ordained, they do share in the priesthood of Christ as an ordained person, but they cannot celebrate Mass, they cannot hear confessions, and they can't become a pastor. Only a priest can become a pastor. And normally they're not called to the priesthood, this is a permanent thing. Married men are invited to become permanent deacons in the Catholic Church. Um, if you become a permanent deacon in the Catholic Church and you're not married, the bishop will probably say, well, why don't you want to become a, a, a priest? But some people might feel called to be a deacon and not a priest. So, so it's open to people who are not married as well if they wish to make a promise of celibacy. But even with deacons, if their spouse dies, if their wife dies, uh, they cannot remarry and remain a deacon. Uh, so, uh, so that's important. Now, the church is a little bit more flexible with deacons whose wives do die, uh, especially if they have young children where they will be released from the promise of celibacy uh, in order to marry, but then they can't function as uh, a deacon any longer. So there's a little bit more flexibility uh, with them. So as I mentioned, the priest uh, is seen as a mediator between God and people, um, and he is to share in uh, not only the sacrificial aspect or the worship aspect, but also the prophetic ministry of the church, the teaching aspect, and also the, the diaconal aspect of, of service. And that's uh, extremely important. Now, what are the, how many of you are, are, are Baptist or, or coming over from the Baptist tradition? Uh, Pentecostal, um, other traditions? Those Protestant denominations that get further away from Lutheranism and um, the Church of England, which is the Episcopal Church here in this country, what Martin Luther did, uh, or at least opened the door to have happen, I don't know if he did it specifically himself, was he eliminated the seven sacraments of the church and only recognized two, baptism and Holy Communion. He saw the other sacraments not as sacraments, but as celebrations or ordinances, but not sacraments instituted by Christ. So he did not see marriage as a sacrament. He did not see holy orders as a sacrament. 
And because of that, the character of holy orders was changed at the Protestant Reformation because it was no longer understood as a sacrament for Protestants, Lutherans, uh, and so on. And then those churches that evolved from Lutheranism uh, did the same thing. Now the Anglican Church initially was a part of the Catholic Church and had the sacramental system, but the break, uh, King Henry VIII, who wanted to make himself the head of the church and take over all the property of the church and give it to his lackeys, um, uh, <laughs> considered himself a Catholic even on his deathbed. But um, that break with Rome on a political level uh, happened kind of at the same time as the Protestant Reformation. So uh, a lot of the Protestant Reformation theology was brought into the Church of England. Uh, there was also Catholic theology that was brought in and there was kind of a tension for a few years uh, between being more Catholic and more Protestant and returning to Catholic roots and then being pulled away again. Uh, but somewhere along that line, and maybe is Buck still here? Who declared their he just like okay uh, well uh, right Leo the tenth declared the holy orders of the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church invalid. as invalid they changed the verb. there was something that they did where they changed the ordination ceremony to reflect more of a Protestant theology and that's when they lost holy orders whereas the Orthodox Church that broke away from the Catholic Church for right. similar reasons political nationalism and all that else maintained the seven sacraments and never changed anything except they broke from the Pope. So their sacraments are valid. They have a valid priesthood. But most Protestant denominations do not have a valid priesthood because they don't believe in holy orders as a sacrament, whereas the uh, Orthodox Church does. Okay? Now, one of the reasons that Martin Luther and subsequent Protestant reformers did away or, or diminished the meaning of the sacrament of holy orders was that they believed in the priesthood of the laity that you didn't need a priest to be a mediator. Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and men. You don't need another man to do that. We don't believe that you need another man to do that either because the priest, who does he rep the ordained priest, who does he represent? Christ. Christ. He's the visible representative of Jesus Christ. He's not Christ, but in a sacramental way, when he acts in the name of Christ, he is showing forth the real presence of Christ in whatever circumstance he's in, whether it's the celebration of the Mass, hearing confessions, and offering forgiveness. Is it the priest forgiving you? Nope. It's Christ acting in the, or the priest is acting in the name of the church and through the ministry of the church, but it's Christ that's doing it. Protestants of the Lutheran and subsequent Reformed tradition do not accept that. And they made a major break with traditional Christianity when they did that because for the first 1500 years that's the way it was both in the Orthodox or the Eastern Rite of the Church and in the Latin Rite and it still is in the Orthodox so there's a over 2000 year tradition of holy orders that uh, Protestant Reformation did away with for example somebody was telling me you know most Baptist churches don't uh, have um, a liturgical style of celebration, uh, but they're adapting it or adopting it in some places. And uh, the minister at First Baptist over here, um, who's now gone, uh, they do celebrate Ash Wednesday there, okay? Uh, but the paper, this is several years ago, and I'm reading this from the paper. The paper interviewed him about how the different you know, denominations in town uh, celebrate Ash Wednesday. And he said, well, in the Catholic Church, a priest or a minister has to place the ashes on you. But Baptists believe in the priesthood of the laity, so what we do is we go up and take the ashes and put it on ourselves. Okay? So that gives you kind of a, 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 a visual difference in how we approach ministry uh, in terms of Protestant and Catholic, that, that we do believe that Jesus Christ is the one mediati mediator and that the priest represents that uh, in his um, ministry. He acts in the person of Christ. Don't you think it's no emphasis on the divine nature of Christ and taking away from his human nature? Say that again. Don't you think it's an over exaggeration or an overuse of the divine, forgetting the human? Uh, in terms of the, the Protestant right. Reformation, right. correct, the correct. Human aspect of Christ. Right. And that, that somehow the human, you know, Martin Luther began the theology that human beings are totally depraved and like worms, and then Presbyterians brought it a, a, a notch further. What, what was the pro Calvin, Calvin systematized it. 
total depravity yeah. or the tulip theology, T-U-L-I-P, total depravity, unconditional salvation, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And the, the biggest conflict between Catholics and Reformed or Presbyterians is total depravity and irresistible grace. Those are the two areas where there's the most theological argument. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's... But then, because of that, that no one could really be an image of Christ right. in a sacramental sense. Uh -huh. In the fall, or the reform, the Presbyterian, the Calvin, in the fall, the image of God was totally destroyed. Nothing remains. And, you know, and I was a Presbyterian minister, and the problem with that is, over time, you realize that Calvinism so cuts man off from God that, that, that you're almost alone in the void. And it's just between you and God. I mean, you don't need a mediator. You don't even need the church. Yeah, yeah. It, in a it, sense. It, it all disappears. Right. And, and it's, so you're sort of left with man over against God. And, you know, there, there, there's a lot of darkness there. But, but right, but, but the, the theological premise is that you can go to God directly. Yes, correct. You don't need anything else. That, you don't need the church, you don't need the sacraments. It might be nice to have a church community and all that, but it's not necessary for your salvation. Ultimately, it's the individual okay. in God. Correct. With Christ as a mediator, but it's very individualized. And that's important for, for those who come from the Protestant tradition to understand that difference, because that is a major difference between uh, Catholic and Orthodox versus um, Calvinism specifically, but even Lutheranism to a certain extent. Although Lutheranism would be a little bit closer to Lutheranism Catholic theology. A little closer to the church. Right, yeah. right. Um, it, it's but Calvinism affects, I know, just, is not just Presbyterian, but it's Southern Baptist too, yeah. right? Yeah. Every Protestant denomination, with the possible exception of the Anglicans, has a debt to John Calvin of some kind. And, you know, it, it sort of permeated Protestant theology. And it, it's theologically kind of complicated, but, but it's, um, it, it's significant because this image of God thing, the church believes that the image of God was sullied and besmirched and, and, you know, messed up, but it wasn't totally destroyed. So there's a basis there for the priest, priesthood, and for mediation, and, and for the church's role in the Christian life. Right. And the church is still the, the vessel of Christ's presence and the sacraments and, and the graces and all of this. The church could prefer those because... The church is in the image of God too, and we're in the image of God, and it's not totally destroyed. But for the Protestant, the image of God is totally destroyed. That means the church too. It's just it's, it's in just as much darkness as the individual sinner. So theologically, it's it's. Um, now that brought to an extreme some forms of Protestants. Protestants, I can't say it. Uh, Protestants. Um, most recognize the need for baptism, correct, and that somebody has to do that for you. Correct. I don't see regenerative. So Most don't Protestants that. will say that baptism is not absolutely necessary for salvation. Correct. That's, it is, because it's a person that's doing it for you. It's a promise of obedience. Okay. And we do it because Christ told us right. to, but it's not necessary for salvation. Right. And that's not biblical. And it's not Catholic. Uh, right, 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 it's right, not biblical right, either. right. And that's important to know those distinctions because it, it transfers to other aspects of why um, maybe some of you are, are, are reluctant to go to a priest for confession. It's based on what we've just described, that you don't need another person to assist you. But I don't know that anybody that would be in that camp would say, well, I, I believe in baptizing myself, no. correct? But they'll complain about going to a priest for confession. But they'll let somebody baptize them. And they'll go to a communion service that somebody else does for them, I presume. Right. Now, you wouldn't do your own private communion service. That would not be uh, uh, her. But they want confession to be private. <laughs> you know, they want the, the Protestant uh, lack of a mediator in the, the clergy to, to, to hear their, not hear their confession. They just want to go directly to Jesus. Yeah, and, and, of course, communion in the Protestant church has been so watered down. Uh, that it's, it's, um, but it has elements of, of what we believe, some uh, elements, and, yeah. The Anglican church and mm -hmm. the Lutheran church still right. maintain. Right. Luther, never, Luther never rejected the real presence. Ever. Right. Anglicans, but the rest of the Protestant churches do not. Well, Episcopalians. Episcopalians are all over the place. They're Anglicans. Well, I know it is, but yeah. Still, you know, well, they they have journeyed away. You know, in the, up until about the 1970s, 
Catholics and Anglicans were coming so close together that many thought there would be a reunion. And then something happened in the 70s to the Episcopal Church that brought them on a different tangent where they changed the nature of holy orders by ordaining women, and well, I'll talk about that in a second, and then changed the meaning of marriage now uh, to include uh, same-sex marriages. And, and so they're going into a different direction altogether. Some are saying that they're becoming more like Unitarians uh, or post-Christian. Uh, they're becoming something else that is not a part of the historic Christian faith. And that's why you see so many uh, Episcopalians wanting to break away from the mainline Episcopal Church and, and align themselves with more Orthodox bishops in the Anglican Communion. And you know where they are? The Orthodox bishops in the Anglican Communion? Africa. Africa. They are the conservative branch of Anglicanism. Yes. You know, it's, it's odd that, mm -hmm. that um, it's the Lutheran Church that, that is more distant from the Catholic Church for some reason. Probably the Lutheran started all. But Lutheran theology is reasonably close to Catholic. And, and if you can find a Lutheran high mass, it looks like ours. I think mm -hmm. they say the words of consecration are different. Slightly places. different. It's, kind of it's very similar. But the history of the Church of England and the Catholic Church is much uglier. 200 years in England, you can be executed for saying mass. Right. Yep. Um, the, the Catholics in England, of which Shakespeare was one, a hidden Catholic, they had to hide it to have mass. In it. And right. There were severe penalties, and the priests be executed. Mm -hmm. uh, there were priests executed. Right. And uh, Henry VIII was uh, he persecuted Catholics, took all their land, all their mm -hmm. churches, closed the monasteries. And, and, and Elizabeth, after him, was uh, or maybe less vicious, but she still uh, was was very much. Um, Anti-Catholic. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to know. You were talking about and you two about Calvinism. What is that? It, John Calvin was. Uh, uh, um, he founded the Presbyterian Church. He was a. Was he Catholic? He was never Catholic himself. No. Yeah. It's called Reformed Church back then. Reformed Church. He's, he's just a Protestant reformer, like Martin Luther. Yeah. His beliefs, what he teaches. But Calvin's theology is kind of considered the. the Pinnacle of Protestant theology. Right. The most, right. Uh, it has had the most influence. It's yeah. Systematic yeah. And, uh, it's organized and all that. Now, let me. Time is out. What am I doing? Oh, you're just changing the thing. I'm not. I don't have to end because the the thing has come. <laughs> Pope to help in the administration of the church, but their primary function is to elect the next pope. Okay. But the Pope is the one who names them. In fact, he just named 24 cardinals and two uh, from the United States. Uh, Archbishop Dolan, Timothy Dolan of New York is now a cardinal, or will be. And Archbishop uh, um, O'Brien, what's his first name? I can't think of his first name. Who was the Archbishop of Baltimore up until about three months ago or six months ago, and then was named to a higher Vatican post and now has been named a cardinal. Edwin O'Brien. Uh, and what's interesting about Edwin O'Brien is that I know him personally. He was an army chaplain and was stationed in Augusta, Georgia at Fort Gordon as an army chaplain. And then when he was the rector of the seminary in Rome, I, I knew him there and, and I just knew him over, over the course of time. And he would, uh, then he became the head of the military archdiocese and would come back to Augusta to celebrate confirmations at Fort Gordon and we would go there and have dinner with him and all that. So it's kind of interesting that I know two cardinals. Now, the other story I have to tell, because this is why I think I'm clairvoyant. Um, <laughs> Archbishop Timothy Dolan, when he was just a lowly Monsignor, a priest and head of the uh, seminary in Rome, the North American College in Rome, uh, around, I was the vocation director and I had two seminarians studying there and uh, I think it was in March of 1995 or 1996, I can't remember, uh, I went to Rome to see one of them be ordained a deacon, Deacon uh, Father Tim uh, McEwen. Well, Father and Monsignor Dolan at that time invited me to dinner in his apartment in the seminary and he invited some other people. Now, I don't know if you've seen him on TV or heard him on the radio, but he's very gregarious. He talks a mile a minute. He knows everything about everything. Uh, he's a great conversationalist. Um, so I'm sitting at the dinner and there's maybe three, or other, three other people there, priests, and I'm thinking to myself, now this is in 1996, this man would make a great Archbishop of New York City. Now, 
The next thing I know, you know, <laughs> you know, what, five years ago, he's named the Archbishop of uh, New York, he's named a bishop, first of all, and then he becomes the Archbishop of New York City, and now he's a, a cardinal. But anyway, it's an honorary title that has some uh, obligations, and, and you have to, uh, up until the age of 80, if you're a cardinal, you can participate in the conclave to elect the Pope, but the Pope would use cardinals for administrative purposes, heading up offices in the Vatican and all the sort, that sort of thing. So they have administrative uh, things. Now, you don't necessarily have to be a bishop to be named a cardinal. Um, who was the Jesuit priest that became a cardinal? He's dead. Um, Avery Dulles. Father Avery Dulles, a Jesuit priest, was named a cardinal, but he was not allowed to participate in the conclave as far as I know. Uh, and I think the Pope Benedict just named an elderly priest a cardinal, but he won't have. It's more of an on honor to uh, somebody that has served the church well. Now the same thing is true with a Monsignor. A Monsignor is just an honorary title given to an ordinary priest. Uh, you, and it's awarded by the Pope, but at the recommendation of the priest bishop. Um, and, and so the Pope names you a Monsignor, but you really don't have any uh, it, it's, it, I hate to use the word prestige, there is a little bit more prestige with it, but it's just an honor. It's an honorary title that is given to some priest and not to others like me who work hard and deserve it. Uh, <laughs> a cardinal deacon is, is a, a, an archbishop uh, who functions as a deacon at a papal liturgy, but he's still a priest. Okay. Someone that would be named a Monsignor that's fairly young, what would they have? It might be the position that they hold uh, with the bishop. They may have a position in the chancery, meaning his administrative office. They could be uh, uh, like Father Furman is, the uh, chancellor or the vicar general. Uh, but normally, m more matured priests or older priests are named Carmen. There was a question? Yes. Uh, did I hear right? Someone said that, 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 uh, that uh, cardinals can be chosen as, as in the laity, like someone is not a it's possible. There's no rule against it. It hasn't happened. So, uh, you know, we're trying, the church is being challenged, the hierarchy, I should say, to include more women in leadership positions in the church, even though they can't be ordained priests, and I'm going to talk about why not in a second. But there's no reason why they couldn't be named a cardinal and still not be a priest. So, so and have some honor in, you know, the Vatican. Uh, but that's a purely a point of discipline. There's no reason against it or for it. Correct, correct. It was correct. Correct, correct. So technically there's no reason why a woman could not be named a cardinal. Technically. Yeah, it would. But 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 they're not ordained, so there's there's no reason for that. Right. They're part right. Correct. So uh, a woman cardinal would be a princess. <laughs> so, pardon? That still applies. It's but it's it's that comes from the period of church history when when you know monarchy was the primary way that uh, governments operated. So in our more democratic system of doing things today, uh, they're still referred to as a prince of the church, but. Um, no, 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 no. We, no, that, that won't happen. Or president of the church. Right, right. Yeah. So it's a, that's, that's, that's but that's, a, that's kind of a, that's not a theological title. It's more of an honorary title. So the prince of the church, he would be treated as a prince in these, in these royal courts as they went around and did Correct, that. correct. He would have he some political power. But you have to keep in mind, that was in a time when the church and state were one. Yes. And that was a time when the church was most corrupt because these people wanted political power. They could care less about the spiritual power, but the spiritual power came with the political power. So it was a, an albatross around their neck. But uh, they really wanted the, the political. And you see that with Islam today, where there's a melding of, of religion and state, and the corruption that that brings to the clergy, who are, are more interested in the political power than actually being authentic spiritual leaders. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. makes sense. Like yeah. Khomeini and now Khomeini. Yeah. Right, you know, exactly. 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 Like well, okay. I mean, and that was what was happening in the Catholic Church in those uh, periods way back. And that's why there was such corruption. Right, right, right. So if someone in the lay could become a, a cardinal, then, then uh, that would have... It was always my understanding that uh, the next pope was chosen from among the cardinals. 
Well, the, 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 uh, the, even the priest that's named a cardinal, you have to be a, a bishop to be able to participate in the election of the Pope if you're a cardinal. So uh, this priest that I was talking about, Father Avery Dulles, could not participate in the conclave even though he was a cardinal. So his, his, uh, it was more of an honorary title. Okay. Now, keep this in mind though. Any man who is a Catholic, whether he's a priest or not, can be elected Pope. Uh, you knew I was going with that. Technically, that hasn't happened since the early church. But what happens is, let's say that you have a conclave and there's a super holy monk who is not a priest in some monastery and they decide to name him the Pope. Well, what would happen is, if he accepted, is uh, he would be ordained a deacon, he would be ordained a, a priest, and then he would be ordained a bishop. And then he would be the Pope. Okay? Could not be married. Could not be married. Correct. Okay. Now let me uh, move on. There's, uh, in the Catholic Church, there's also two other types of priests, or two types of priests, I should say. There are secular priests, or what we call uh, diocesan priests, of which I am one, meaning that I have be, been ordained for the Diocese of Savannah, so I'm married to the Diocese of Savannah. I won't be moved out of the Diocese of Savannah by my bishop unless he puts me into exile somewhere. Uh, so I'm married to the, and he can put me in any parish in the Diocese of Savannah, which covers the southern half of the state of Georgia, including Augusta, Macon, and Columbus. Diocese. Diocesan bishop. Uh, I'm a diocesan priest, which is also known as a secular priest. Okay? Then there are what are called religious order priests, who belong to a religious order. Uh, and they would have joined the religious order before they became a priest and then eventually were ordained priests. And that would be like Jesuits and Franciscans and uh, Dominicans, Augustinians, which Martin Luther was one. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And their primary uh, allegiance is to their religious order and their superior in their religious order. Oddly enough, our new bishop, Bishop Gregory Hartmeyer, is a Franciscan, okay, yeah. priest, or, or belongs to the first Franciscan order. But as soon as he was named bishop, now Fran or, religious order priests make three vows, um, chastity, obedience, and poverty. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. As soon as Bishop Hartmeyer was named the bishop of the Diocese of Savannah, because the bishop of a diocese is corporate soul and owns everything in the diocese, he was released from his vow of poverty. Okay? Uh, so, so uh, but th that's the two. Does everybody, everybody understand the two? There's, we do the same thing. We're still priests, but one's allegiance is to their religious community, the other's is to their local bishop. Well, didn't, didn't I, I read something and also, he was released of, of his obedience to his superior in the Franciscans. Yeah. It's possible that a pope resigned, yes, and could join a monastery. One has marked. I don't know who it was. There has been one. 500 years but even Pope Benedict has said that if he felt that he became incapacitated, that he would consider resignation too. So I would suspect that he has a document somewhere saying, if such and such happens, then I submit my resignation. That would be very. Un it would be unusual because of the division that it could cause in the church if you had two, you know, a former pope and a current pope. Uh, so it could be problematic down the road. Yeah. Yes. Are monks not priests? Monks could be priests, but not necessarily. So a monk could be uh, like a brother who uh, is not ordained but has taken vows, or he could be a brother that then becomes a, a priest and he's still considered a monk. Okay. Now with with sisters or women in religious life, they're never ordained priests, uh, but they can be the head of their religious order and they can run hospitals. In fact, when we had an abundance of them up until the 50s and early 60s, they had more power in the church than most priests because they ran hospitals and schools and trained future priests and did all kinds of things uh, and, and were, were avant-garde in terms of women doing things that uh, they didn't normally do in the uh, secular life like being heads of hospitals and all that sort of thing. Uh, so they kind of were uh, at the forefront of, of the women's movement, if you will, because they were able to do so much that married women were not able to do. Um, yes? Anyone else at the 
Well, it's because it's not so much the schools are getting away from nuns, but the numbers of sisters have declined. Uh, there, there's been a radical change in the way they live since the last 40 years, and that confusion has not attracted new candidates. Now, we're coming out of that, but I don't know that we're ever going to be like we were in the 1950s, because you have to keep in mind there was um, larger Catholic families, too. You know, Catholic families had eight, nine, ten, eleven children, so it was almost an expectation at least one or two would become a priest or a nun. Now, when you have Catholic families only have one or two children, you're not going to have as <laughs> the pool is shrunk. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's another complicating factor as well. Are no. At one time, I would say in the 1960s, in Macon, Georgia, between St. Peter Claver, St. Joseph, and Mount DeSales, there may have been upwards to 40 nuns in this city. Today we have five. Okay, and at Sisters of Mercy, there is only two. There are only two, and they're both retired. There used to be a hospital here. Now let me conclude, since we're almost, uh, as to why women cannot be ordained priests and never will be in the Catholic Church. As, uh, as try as society is to make us change that. From a sociological point of view, no, there is no reason why a woman cannot be ordained a priest. Because they could do, and probably better than most men, the function of a priest. You know, they, uh, they would be very good visiting the sick and being empathetic and, and intuitive and all of that. So there's, it's not a sociological reason. Certainly, they could do it uh, from a so sociological and psychological uh, point of view. But the reason that they cannot be ordained priest is because it is divinely revealed that they cannot be ordained priest. Because it is no accident that God became incarnate of the human race as a man, not as a woman. Jesus is the Son of Man, which refers to the people of God collectively, but also to a man, in the male sense, who embodies the people of God, the Messiah. So the Old Testament term and New Testament term, son of man, is an extremely important theological term uh, that applies to the Messiah. Not son of people, not son of woman, but son of man. And he has to be a man. And Jesus is. Jesus is both priest and rabbi or prophet. He offers himself to God, but also communicates or teaches as a prophet would. Jesus embodies both in his divine personhood and, and priesthood. Priests in the Old Testament were male. This was in complete contradiction to the false pagan religions which had female priests. So it wasn't a, a cultural thing because in the culture of the Old Testament, women did become priestesses in the pagan cults, correct? Yes, okay. But not in the Old Testament priesthood. And that was a uh, uh, an intentional act not to have that, okay? And we believe it's divinely revealed. The religion of Israel and the God of Israel was much greater than the pagan religions and their gods and goddesses. Jesus himself is male. That's not an accident of biology. It was intentional for a number of reasons. The Catholic ordained priesthood is configured to the exclusive high priesthood of Jesus and also to his prophetic functions uh, during his public ministry. The church teaches that at the sacrifice of the Mass, the Catholic priest acts in the person of Christ, offers Christ himself as the sacrificial lamb who is consumed. The maleness of the priest makes visible in a sacramental way the reality of the exclusive high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus, and this is another reason, is also the bridegroom of the church, correct? Can a bridegroom be female? Well, our society is trying to uh, redefine that, but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, from natural law and divine law, no. Not just no, but hell no. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. The church, on the other hand, collectively, is seen as the bride of Christ and the mother of the faithful. For through her, new members are born through holy baptism. In a sense, we can say that Christ, the bridegroom, begets children through his bride, the church. The maleness of the priesthood and the femininity of the collective nature of the church, or the church, are essential to Catholic Church's understanding of first Christ and of the ordained priesthood. 
So, if you believe what the church teaches, that the Catholic priest is an icon or a sacramental sign of Jesus Christ, the high priest and the bridegroom, and that that is made most explicit at the celebration of the Mass, especially at the consecration, what does it say to have a woman doing that? That his humanity and his maleness means nothing. That is, say that again? That his humanity means nothing. And his maleness means nothing. Uh, that, that the priest is just a functionary that anybody can accomplish. Okay? And the sacramental aspect is not important. That's right. Now that's why in the Protestant tradition that doesn't have holy orders, it doesn't matter whether the person celebrating a communion service in the Protestant tradition is male or female, because they don't have the same theology of the priesthood as the Catholic Church or the Orthodox churches have. Okay, uh, so it's it, they're, they're, they don't have a valid priesthood to begin with, so it doesn't matter uh, in their tradition whether or not it's a male or a female. But it does matter in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox uh, Church. The other thing, ha which if, like the Episcopal Church that had a theology similar to us about the priesthood but has changed it radically in the last 30 years, if you then allow women to become bishops and priests and to celebrate the Eucharist with a veneer of what it looks like in terms of the Catholic Mass, and you have a woman doing that, what is the implication of that? There's no gender. What does that imply then for marriage? That Jesus could be a woman. <laughs> there is no, that marriage is between two people. That have two to people, yeah. male, female, Whatever. female, female. It doesn't matter. Anything between two consenting mammals. Correct, okay, <laughs> basically. So you can see how in the Episcopal Church, and I would say also in, in Protestant denominations that have, have eliminated the Catholic understanding of priesthood, why they would be more open to same-sex marriage. Why not? Okay. Yeah, they have a woman as a priest. Mm -hmm. Why not? Exactly. So, and then in addition to that, uh, that's the theological and doctrinal basis for it. As you know, in the Catholic Church there are those priests and maybe even some bishops who are pushing for the ordination of women just as there were in the Episcopal Church and there's certainly laity in the Catholic Church who are pushing for women priests and there have been some women in the Catholic Church who have attempted to be ordained but it's the mockery of the sacrament because they're not ordained priests but they think that they are and they've been excommunicated and those who participate in those ceremonies are excommunicated because it's it's a, 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 a crime in canon law to a priest or to feign a sacrament, uh, uh, so and the penalty is excommunication. Um, but um, what was I saying in that regard? Because the Pope is aware uh, of, of this push to kind of adapt the Church to sociological principles rather than divine law, uh, and I can't remember the year it was, but it may have been around 1998, uh, Pope John Paul II issued a decree that women, it is, uh, it is a defined infallible teaching of the church that women cannot be ordained priests. And he based it upon this, that the Pope has no authority to change that teaching. No authority whatsoever. Because it is revealed in the tradition of the church and the Pope can't just do whatever he wants. Uh, whether he wanted to or not, he cannot change that. And so it's infallibly defined that uh, only men can be priests. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then um, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to argue that. That's the way it is. That's the way it is, and I, and I would agree with it. But if, if, if you, like you said, you have a problem with drawing females, they become nuns, and you've got instead of 40, you've got five, two of which are retired. Um, couldn't they just make a, a, another office or, or another level? Of, like, say, you got nuns, and then what, Reverend Mother? Well, but they're not so priests. They have another hierarchy within their own thing. It would not be ordained yet. Would still well, they have that. We have that. I mean, we already have that. Yeah, we have that. An abbess of a, a medieval monastery had political power. She was the head of that community and the surrounding community. And she also had some rights in some medieval monasteries where the abbess could wear a, a mitre. Really? Yes and wear a crozier and a bishop's glove and ring 
only for ceremonial purposes and could offer a blessing. But she could not celebrate That's mass. Just so unheard of. I mean, yeah. But no, there's a history of yeah. Well, it, it faded out, uh, but, but in medieval Europe, during the time of monarchy, that was possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. convinced the Pope to return to Rome. Catherine, St. Catherine of Siena. Yeah, she, she moved the, the papacy back right. to Rome. Right. She was pretty powerful. <laughs> okay, are there any questions on that, the priesthood and, and, and the reason why we can't ordain women? Because we, because of that, we're being accused, Catholics are, and the Pope and the bishops, of being bigots uh, in two areas. Um, first of all, that we refuse women the right to become priests, okay, and so we're being marginalized in our society because of that, and because we say that marriage is only between one man and one woman, and we are saying that those uh, same-sex attractions uh, are lesser citizens because they can't get married. We're not saying that, but that's what they're saying about us, okay? So you have to be aware of that, that there is a very strong political strain that goes all the way up to the president of the United States um, <laughs> that is marginalizing Orthodox Catholic teaching, especially as it concerns um, what some would consider a, a civil right and civil rights. Now, what's interesting, the Catholic Church was at the forefront of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, and now we're being marginalized as those redneck bigots that were opposed to the civil rights movement as it concerns same-sex marriage and women priesthood. So you have to be aware of that phenomenon uh, that's going on now. So any questions on that? Yes. Uh, Joel Osteen, is that, am I saying it right? Joel Osteen, yeah. Okay. No, so homosexuality is not a sin. Not a sin. It is the act, the sexual act outside of marriage that is a sin, whether you're a heterosexual or homosexual. Okay, it's not your orientation that is a sin. Okay, uh, it is the heterosexual that has sex outside of marriage that is the sinner. The same for a homosexual. Okay, so that has got to be made clear. Okay, now we would say that homo the Catholic Church would say that homosexuality, though, is a result of the fallen state brought on by original sin and that that uh, it's inclined to be disordered okay but that doesn't mean that the person we're all disordered aren't we I mean in one way or the other you know I'm not as smart as you so I'm disordered that doesn't insult me uh, you know because I have a disorder intellectually um, and my sexuality might be disordered in one way or another whether you're heterosexual or, or homosexual uh, your desires may be disordered uh, so there's nothing wrong with that you know part of, of overcoming a disorder is acknowledging it uh, so so that's, uh, that's there's no offense meant to anybody when I diagnose she was being paranoid schizophrenic. I mean, uh, we're not saying that that's normal. Uh, and you may have been born that way because of original sin or whatever. I don't know. Uh, so, so, or maybe not, you know. A lot of people are saying, well, I was born this way. I was born homosexual. It might be the case that you were, but that's because of original sin. So, uh, so just, just, we have to keep all of that in proper perspective, okay? The Lord be with you. Let us together pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.